So, continuing where we stopped last time, um, we want to look at uh, recurrences. Oops. So, the reason why we are interested in recurrences is because they naturally arise uh, in estimations of time complexity of recursive algorithms uh, such as divide and conquer algorithms, right? That's the only reason, in fact, uh, why we are uh, studying them now. Uh, because when you have a recursive algorithm, right, that is defined by calling itself an instance of uh, this algorithm involves calling the very same algorithm on smaller size instances, right? As it's a, uh, the case for merge sort, right? How do we do merge sort? We split the array in two halves, recursively apply uh, merge sort to the two halves, and then we merge the sorted halves, right? So what is the runtime of such an algorithm? Well, we cannot write it explicitly, right? But uh, such algorithm must satisfy the following recurrence. The time complexity, the time necessary, the number of steps needed to execute merge sort on an array of size n, an array that contains n elements, is equal twice the number of steps necessary to perform the very same algorithm on arrays of size only one half of n, right? Because to do merge sort uh, on the array between p and r, uh, we split it into two and then recursively call uh, these two instances. So if uh, uh, p minus r is n, then t of n satisfies two times uh, t of n over 2 plus the overhead incurred on, at each step of, rec of recursion. What do we do? Um, uh, what, are the, uh, what are these intermediate steps? Well, it's splitting the array into two, and then subsequently after the, these two instances exit, we have to merge the array. And clearly both splitting the array and then merging the sorted sub-arrays uh, is in linear time. So T of n satisfies this relationship, right? T of n is two times T of n over two plus C of n. We understand that, right? Okay, in general, recurrences will be of the following form coming from divide and conquer algorithms. So we will assume that divide and conquer proceeds as follows. It reduces a problem of size n to a many problems of smaller size n over b. Now, uh, a is, of course, bigger or equal than 1, because you have to have at least one uh, sub-problem. Most often, A is, in fact, bigger than 1, but it can be 1. Um, and B is uh, a number that has to be greater than 1 in order for the size uh, N over B to drop. But B doesn't have to be integer. So number of uh, sub-problems A is definitely an integer, but B doesn't necessarily have to be an integer. So... Uh, for example, it can be 4 over 3, which means that the uh, size drops from n to uh, 3 quarters of n, right? When you divide n by uh, 4 over 3. Okay, so we are also assuming that the overhead cost of splitting the big problem of size n into smaller sub-problems and uh, the cost of combining the solutions obtained recursively of, on these sub 
problems that uh, will cost us some overhead f of n. So f of n in, term, in case of merge sort was the cost of splitting the array in two halves. And then once uh, the, uh, the subroutines for the sub problems exit, we have to merge the, the two sub arrays. And this is done in linear time. So for merge sort f of n will be something like c times n, right? Where c is a constant. So what is then the time complexity of such an algorithm? Again, we don't have an explicit formula, but we know that uh, the runtime has to satisfy this recurrence. T of n is equal a many subproblems being solved, each subproblem of size n over b, right? Plus the overhead of splitting and then combining the solutions um, of the subproblems. Okay, so this is a little bit simplified because it's not necessary, and sometimes, in fact, it uh, does happen that not all subproblems are of the same size. But uh, this is kind of good enough in most of the practical applications that uh, we will encounter. Uh, but it can be generalized. Okay, so again, we will not bother uh, writing ceilings and floors uh, um, because the tiny sloppiness cannot change the asymptotic bound. Okay, so uh, visually, this is the tree of recursion. A big instance of size n is split into a many instances uh, of size n over b. And our task is to determine what is the total work needed to uh, complete the whole uh, uh, procedure for instance of size n. And you can see because we are splitting the array in chunks of size n over b, how many times can you divide uh, n by b? So first you divide it, you get n over b. Next time you divide, you get n over b squared. How, uh, how, what's the depth? How many times can you divide n by b? It's the log, of course, of basis b uh, of, number with, uh, of number n, because whatever this number is, b to that power should be um, approximately equal to n. Okay, so what we would like to do is, you remember for merge sort and also for the Karatsuba algorithm, we actually derived the explicit uh, uh, estimate for T of n, but it, we, this involved lots of uh, not very pleasant calculations. Yes? So do you have an example where A would not be equal to B? When A would not be equal to B. That's, for example, uh, so um, the question is, what would be an example when A is not equal to B? For example, uh, in the failed approach, A and B were both true, but Karatsuba was smart to reduce multiplication of two n-bit numbers to only three multiplications of numbers of size n over two, right? So that would be um, an example. Okay, so... Uh, we will not, some recurrences uh, can be solved explicitly and there is uh, quite a bit of machinery, something called generating functions, and, but we will not need that because we are not interested in exact number of steps, but only about the asymptotic uh, behavior of the number of steps needed. Is it uh, uh, proportional to n, or is it proportional to n squared, or maybe n cube, or n log n? Um, with the caveat, of course, that um, it's not just enough to say our algorithm runs in time c times uh, n, uh, but we also have to have a guarantee that this c is not exorbitant, right? So. Um, we have to keep all, no, we don't have to find exact constants, but we have to have reasonable bounds for the size of the constants. 
Okay, and what is master theorem? Master theorem is simply a cookbook recipe that allows you, if I give you A and B and F, to tell me, to tell immediately for most of the cases, what will be the growth rate, uh, what the growth rate of the recurrence will be. So, Let's just look at master theorem and the formulation. So uh, here it says uh, let they both be integers, but b doesn't have to be, but uh, it will be in most of the, in all applications that uh, we will do. Uh, so a and b are, the a is number of uh, subproblems, b is this uh, factor um, that reduces n to a fraction n over b. And f of n is the overhead, and we can assume that it's a non-decreasing function, that uh, the overhead for larger instances will be um, larger or equal to overhead for smaller instances. <coughs> then, if t of n is the solution of this um, recurrence, which means the estimate for the runtime <coughs> of a divide and conquer procedure that reduces a problem of size n to a many sub-problems of size n over b incurring overhead f over n, then we have um, three cases, okay? So first case is if f of n grows really slow, what do I mean by that? If f of n grows not only small, uh, slower than n over log b of a, n to the power log b of a, but it actually grows slower than n to the log b of a minus some tiny epsilon, right? So the upper bound for f of n is strictly slower growing than this uh, exponent n to the log b of a. Yeah? In that case, uh, t of n will be theta of n to the log b of a. Yeah? Okay, so we will see examples in a moment. This is to be read as if f of n grows substantially slower than this let's call it polynomial, uh, this exponent n to the log b of a, then the growth rate is precisely this uh, polynomial-like factor uh, n to the log b of a, okay? If it turns out that the overhead grows precisely as n to the log b of a, then the recurrence, the complexity of your algorithm grows precisely as uh, n to the log b of a times uh, log 2 of n. So this polynomial, if f of n exactly matches log, uh, sorry, n to the log b of a, then the growth rate of t of n is obtained from this polynomial by multiplying it with an extra log. Okay? So, the third case, if f of n grows substantially faster than n to the log b of a, what do, you, what do we mean by that? We mean that f of n grows faster than, not only faster than the polynomial n to the log b of a, but it actually grows faster than n to the log b of a plus some tiny little amount added to, to the exponent. Uh, unfortunately, uh, without these epsilons, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the master theorem in this form doesn't work. So here in the third case, unfortunately, also we have to add an extra assumption Namely, that a times, so remember this is number of cases, this is the size decrease, a times f of n over b has to be smaller than some constant smaller than 1 times f of n. If this is the case, 
then the growth rate of the solution is exactly the growth rate of the overhead. So, um, we will, uh, okay, so in the past years, uh, when I was more, I was actually going through the detail of the proof uh, of master theorem, uh, but um, my popularity started dropping really quickly, <laughs> and the half-life of the size of the class was about uh, one week. <laughs> so, um, the deal is, uh, uh, actually the proof is remarkably simple. It's, the proof is kind of complicated, but conceptually very, very simple and easy. In fact, you saw it, we did it for the Karatsuba uh, algorithm. So it's only ugly, but it is not evil, okay? So um, I'll just give you a very brief sketch. Why did I teach the proof? Not because... Uh, I wanted to enlighten you with another proof, but for the following practical reason. It can happen that the master theorem fails, that it is not applicable, but the proof still works. So you can tiny little bit tweak the proof and actually get estimate when master theorem verbatim simply doesn't apply. Okay? Now, Obviously, these are not exhaustive cases, and lo and behold, if none of these three conditions holds, then master theorem cannot tell you the growth rate. So that's the bad news, but the good news is that in vast majority of cases, uh, the mas this master theorem actually works and it gives you, um, without any computation, the growth rate of your recursive algorithm. So let us, okay, we will go back to this remark later. Let's first see some examples. So assume that you have a recursive procedure that reduces a problem of size n to four problems of size n over 2 plus a linear overhead. Okay? We want to estimate then what is the growth rate, what's the asymptotic behavior of the number of steps needed to execute your algorithm, right? So uh, remember in the master theorem, the pivoting kind of quantity was this polynomial n to the log b of a, right? In our case, n to the log b of a is n log with the basis that is b, the reduction factor, of the number of cases, which is n squared. Now, notice that this polynomial grows faster than the overhead. In fact, your overhead is bounded from above by n to this log, which is a polynomial, minus epsilon. What can you take for epsilon? Any number smaller than 1. For example, if you take epsilon to be 1 half, you get that n is O of n to the power 1 and a half, which is obviously true. Right? And then immediately, Master Theorem uh, allows you to deduce that the growth rate of your recurrence is uh, precisely this polynomial, in which case is n squared. Okay? So you see, all what we had to do is uh, find this polynomial. This is not quite a polynomial because log b of a is not an integer, but it's convenient to call it a polynomial, generalized polynomial, right? So uh, you co simply find this polynomial, n to the log 2 of 4 in this case, which is n squared, and you realize that this grows much faster than n. 
In fact, you can deduce a small amount, anything smaller than one, like for example, one half, and still get an upper bound for n. So consequently, the first case of master theorem applies and you conclude that the growth, that the, your algorithm will run in n squared many steps without doing any uh, calculations. Let's see uh, next example, which is our merge sort, right? Because we reduce a problem of size n to two sub-problems of size n over 2 plus c of n. And you remember we had to do this bookkeeping to find out the growth rate of the, uh, the number of steps your algorithm takes. But master theorem allows you to conclude this without any calculation. Why? Again, we find uh, this pivoting polynomial n to the log b of a. In our case, this will be n and then log of uh, with basis 2 of 2, which is just n to the first power, just n. So notice now the overhead and the polynomial have precisely the same growth rate. And the second case of the master theorem then tells you, in this case, um, the, so in this case, because they are exactly of the same growth rate, the polynomial and the overhead, we know that the solution will grow as the polynomial times long n. But in our case, this polynomial is n to the power 1 log n, so it grows as n log n, without any thinking how deep is the recursion and how many steps you we perform on each level. Simply a recipe tells you immediately uh, what is the growth what is the asymptotic behavior of the runtime of your algorithm? Let's look at another example. T of n is equal three times T of n over four plus n. So you are splitting a problem of size n into three sub problems, three sub problems of size n over four with an overhead that is linear. So what do we get uh, as a solution then? Well, again, we form just this pivoting polynomial n to the log b of a, and we see that, so, sorry? Because, uh, thank you for this question. So uh, the question is why did we multiply in our in this example, this polynomial with log n, because Her Majesty the Master Theorem says, if it happens that your overhead grows precisely at the same speed as your polynomial, the solution grows as this polynomial times log 2 of n. Why? Okay, so it uh, it is uh, your wish. I have to go through the proof of Master Theorem. <laughs> it is not a big deal uh, at all. Uh, it's a very good question. You know, look, why should you just memorize something without understanding why it is true? So the right attitude is to look why it's true. And it's actually a really simple a bit calculation, messy calculations, but you see where this come, comes from. So I'll sketch the proof, and on the slides you have the details of all three cases, which I'm sure all of you are dying to read tonight and uh, uh, figure out the proof of all three cases. But uh, um, this is an example of something that why is not obvious. It takes a bit of mathematical mumbo-jumbo to figure out uh, where this comes from. And this will be often the case with algorithms um, 
often the solution will not be obvious. Uh, and this is why we need mathematics in algorithm design. See, you know, what is the value of mathematics? What do you think? Hmm? Teaches you to think. That's absolutely right. But to put it on the provocative statement, it allows you to do things you don't understand. <laughs> How is that true? I am told that the light is simultaneously a stream of particles and a wave of electromagnetic radiation. How can something be simultaneously little particles and electromagnetic wave? You go ask anyone in the physics school if they understand quantum mechanics, and if they are honest, they will all say that they have no slightest clue. <laughs> so, but nevertheless, computers couldn't be made without quantum mechanics, right? The, the transistor effect can be understood only from the point of view of quantum mechanics. Now, the beautiful thing about mathematics is that we derive certain um, ideas from things that we understand, but then we generalize the very same calculus to things that we have absolutely no clue, but we can formally verify that they still must be true. So this is actually a very good point, and uh, um, let me show you a without quantum mechanics example of uh, what I am saying. How do we find the surface area of an ellipse? Well, one can do, you know, uh, play, uh, two dimensional integrals, but it's very actually easy to see. If you, what is an ellipse? An ellipse is a projection of a circle, right? That is, uh, okay, let me be a little bit less cubist, right? It's a projection of a circle, right? If I slice this projection with lines that are orthogonal to the intersection of these two planes, you can see that this dimension reduces exactly by the cosine of this angle, right? While the parallel dimension, dimension that is parallel with the line, doesn't shrink. So then the surface area of the ellipse must be the surface area of the circle times cosine theta, right? Because this is how this, uh, each of these uh, uh, rectangles, when projected, its surface area shrink, shrank precisely for cosine theta, right? And this is, of course, 2 pi r squared cosine theta, and this gives you 2 pi r times, let's call b, the size of the small axis. So lo and behold, the surface area of an ellipse is product of the two axes times 2 pi. And that's pretty obvious. Now, how do you find the volume of, a, of an ellipsoid, an egg? You do, you can do uh, integration in three dimensions, but you can say the following. <laughs> Mathematics doesn't care whether your space is two-dimensional, three-dimensional, or four-dimensional when it comes to basic geometry. So an egg is projection of a sphere living in a four-dimensional space, projected to another, uh, projected to another three-dimensional space, right, that is under angle alpha. And lo and behold, the very same thing works. But do we have an understanding of what four-dimensional space looks like? No, but we do it by analogy. 
So people who do quantum mechanics, they simply uh, make a mathematical model and have no clue about interpretation of the terms. But mathematics still works. And this is the value of the mathematics. And similar applies in algorithms, right? It takes a non-trivial proof to show uh, how things work. And uh, the same is true about the, uh, about, um, about the proof of master theorem. OK. So after this digression, uh, why you should stop worrying and learn to love math. Um, so the short answer to your question is uh, this log came into the play because master theorem calls for it. Uh, and if you analyze the proof of the master theorem, you will see where it pops up. OK, so now let us do and for example, this example is uh, a case. Let's see what we get as a polynomial here. It's n to the log b of a, which is n to the log 4 of 3, which is about n to the power 0 0.8. Now notice, this guy n grows not only faster than n to the point 0.8, but I can add a little bit here, make it n to the 0 0.85, and still have something that grows slower than n. And it's easy also to see that the, third, that the extra condition a f n over b uh, to be smaller than c times f of n, if you substitute the numbers, you get the this amount to saying that 3 quarters of n is smaller than c times n for some c. And lo and behold, you can take for c 0.8 and have this satisfied. And then the recipe tells you the solution to your equation grows precisely as the overhead. Okay, in which case, in this case, it's equal to n, right? Now, Let's look at another example. T of n is 2 times n over 2 plus n log n. Um, here, uh, this is almost, uh, it would be a divide and conquer algorithm, just like merge sort, except the overhead is not linear, but n log n, because maybe it involves sorting. Let's try to apply master theorem. We compute this n to the log b of a, which is n to the log 2 of 2, which is n, right? And compare it with the overhead. Now, clearly, n log n grows faster than n. But unfortunately, it doesn't grow faster than n to the power 1 plus epsilon. And lo and behold, the master theorem breaks down. Now, even though the master theorem breaks down, the proof actually can be tweaked to cover this case as well, which if you are taking extended class, we will have the pleasure of enjoying as a homework. Okay, so um, you have a hint how to prove this. And uh, so what, let me scare you, master theorem proof, uh, so what is the upshot? Look, I don't even ask you to memorize master theorem. On the exam, on the midterm, if you need master theorem, I will actually print it on the text of the problem. I don't want you to memorize anything whatsoever in this course. Why should you memorize the recipe for master theorem? if you can look it up in your notebook you. once you are at work. But I want you to be able to understand how to apply master theorem. And if you want to kind of make sure that uh, you can uh, work around cases if master theorem uh, fails, uh, you can also look up at the proof because it's really actually simple. 
So just make sure you understand how to use master theorem and what it says. Because on midterms I get uh, really, really strange things how students apply master theorem. Um, so if I have, say if I have something like this, say T of n is equal to uh, T, uh, say, 3 times T of n minus 5 plus n. Can I apply master theorem? No. no. Why not? Because master theorem, the argument has to decrease as by a fraction, not by a constant value. So just make sure that you understand um, how to apply master theorem. Don't bother memorizing it because you will have it if, not, if you need it on the exams. So let me now enlighten the lady who was curious why, uh, where this log came from. It's actually astonishingly simple. What do we do? What did we do when we analyzed the Karatsuba algorithm? You unroll the recurrence. You simply substitute bigger cases with smaller and smaller cases and look how things grow. So in this case, right, if this is true, t of n is a times t of n over b plus f of n, if I substitute n by n over b, I get that t of n over b is equal a times t of n over b squared plus f of n over b. Then I can also replace n by n over b squared, and lo and behold, I get this for smaller and smaller and smaller cases. And then I substitute these smaller cases in the bigger cases. How? I simply chain. I start with the original recurrence, and then I say, aha, this t of n over b can be replaced using uh, this formula with this expression, lo and behold, here it is. And then I do a little bit of housekeeping. This becomes a squared t of n over b squared plus a times f of n over b plus f of n. Then I say, ah, but this expression here can be expressed using even smaller input, n over b cube. And lo and behold, I simply replace this using this formula by the right-hand side. Again, a little bit of housekeeping, and I get this. How many times can I do that? I can do that for as long as n over b cube doesn't hit 1, right? Which means I can do it as many times as I can divide n by b, which is, of course, precisely um, uh, log b of n. So at the very end, when I hit the rock bottom, this will be a to the log b of n times this will be just t of, of 1, right? And here I have this sum of accumulated overheads, right? Now I use this trick that a and n can swap places. So this will be right, uh, this will become n to the power log b of a rather than a to the uh, log b of n, n and a swap the places, plus this sum of overheads. And now master theorem proof does something totally simple. It uh, simply looks who grows faster. This term n to the log b of a, which is just our pivoting polynomial, or this sum. So given different assumptions about uh, uh, growth rate of f, this sums to something either exactly equal to the polynomial or something that is the polynomial times log n or something strictly smaller than polynomial, namely, or something that is strictly larger than polynomial, which is just f of n. And that's all. And if you do the jumbo-mumbo calculation here, 
it's not, it's really just basic algebra. Uh, you can uh, get the estimate after a little bit of pain uh, to be exactly of this. In the second case, which is what the lady asked, you again do some mumbo jumbo, and lo and behold, you, this log n pops out of the top. This log here uh, produces this log b of n uh, when you do the calculation, okay? So, uh, and this is the third case, as I say, um, you definitely need to understand how you use master theorem to estimate the runtime of divide and conquer algorithms, right? We will do uh, plenty of examples as we move through the material. Don't have to memorize master theorem and uh, if you are not totally math adverse, I promise you it will not kill you if you go through the proof to see all the mysteries when, where the logarithm comes uh, from. Okay, so we have a deal on the, in this uh, uh, respect. So uh, what we are going to do next will be something really interesting, large integer uh, multiplication, right? But I guess because we have 10 minutes left, um, let us just see how Karatsuba uh, immediately comes out of the master theorem. You remember that Karatsuba split into two and get by with only three multiplications. Uh, so the recurrence was, uh, let's see, what was the recurrence? It was this. T of n is three times T of n over two plus C of n, right? Because we did only three multiplications of numbers of approximately size n over two plus C of n. Let's apply master theorem. What do we have to do? We simply have to uh, compute this critical polynomial, n to the log b of a. What is this? This is n to the log 2 of 3, which is bigger than 1. And uh, even if I reduce it tiny little bit, because log 2 of 3 is... Uh, um, 1.5 approximately, between 1.5 and 1.6. For as long as I take uh, epsilon to be smaller than, uh, say, 0.4, I can reduce uh, um, my, uh, I, can, uh, I can reduce this power n to the log 2 of 3 by some small amount and still beat the growth rate of n. And the master theorem tells us that in this case, uh, your recurrence immediately says that uh, uh, in that case, the first case of master theorem applies and you get that the solution is just the polynomial itself, which in this case is just n to the power 1.585. So if you remember what we did last time, this ugly calculation, it's gone because we use the recipe provided by the master theorem. We will also use master theorem to show that slicing your number in more and more pieces uh, will get you in trouble, right? Uh, so, um, because we are out of time, next week we will generalize Karatsuba algorithm, uh, show why it fails, uh, and then introduce uh, a concept of fast Fourier transform, which is the most important algorithm running at present day.
Okay, so I'll see you next week. You mentioned fast Fourier transform. Yeah. The fast Fourier, or specifically, or just the...